Hey everybody, Dan Holstein here, helping your business take flight. And today I'm really delighted to have Jamie Cunningham, who was my very first business coach, as well as the firm owner of Sales Up Business Coaching in Australia, author of Jumping Off the Hamster Wheel. And uh, he's an active investor with Whetstone, which is the firm that invests in and guides growth companies. So Jamie, welcome. Thanks, Dan. Great to be here. Great to see you. So, you know, as we know, as, as being a business owner, it can be tumultuous at times. And especially these days, there's so much going on. So much that's out of our control, a lot of uncertainty. And our conversation today is going to be centered around what are some of the things that we could do, some strategies that we can do to keep our head on straight, be able to do what we need to do and, and rise above some of the chaos that's that's happening all around us right now. So, Jimmy, um, in our pre-discussion, you mentioned you have several different strategies that you find are really effective, uh, you know, to help a business owner stay focused keep a good, positive, optimistic mindset. And, and the term you used was stay a balanced mindset. So why don't we start there? How do we define a balanced mindset? Well, I use the word balance. It is a, a bit of a loaded word, but I think sometimes having the notion that we have to be positive and you know, positivity is the right way to be is a bit of a dangerous paradigm because I don't think it's realistic, <laughs> basically. Right. And it sets us up for failure to some degree. Um, absolutely, if you're going to attack a problem, you're better off having a positive mindset first than negative. But the human state says that we do go up and down. And I think we've got to give, that, give ourselves permission to do that. So having a more, more balanced approach to it, I think is a, it's, it's sort of setting yourself up to win a little easier. Gotcha. And I imagine there's a different level of balance for different situations, time, and, and perhaps even personalities. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is a very individual thing. Uh, what works for me could be different than what works for you. It's about, I find, getting sort of really being reflective on where you are and understanding if you feel like you are in the right kind of balance for you. I know that's very uh, unmeasurable, but that's kind of the way it is. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's, it's great to be up on highs and it's okay to be down in the deepest lows. But if we're sort of hanging out in either one of those for extended amounts of time, it usually has some cost to it that we, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to bear. Gotcha. It's kind of uh, what that reminds me of is the whole flatten the curve that we've heard about COVID recently. Oh, and when I think about the so, sort of what you're describing, the highs, and it's like a roller coaster. If we want to kind of compress those waves up and down and find that middle ground where we can have, you know, great days and challenging days, but not be so extreme in how we're feeling about things. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's having a sort of a bit of a toolbox where you can bring yourself down a bit off the highs and also a toolbox where you can, uh, you know, bring yourself out of the lows. And, you know, I think the, the common saying or someone's cliche, I'm not sure whose it was, says, you know, it's never, it's never as good as you think it is and it's never as bad as you think it is. Um, that's sort of a good, a good foundation to think about, I, I think, anyway. That might be a really good post to note for everyone's monitor about this this time. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Exactly. As well as this too shall pass. Yeah, I think ab absolutely. And, you know, all of this we're, we're going to discuss is obviously with the caveat that, you know, people can find themselves in significant mental states that are unhealthy and do require more than what we're going to talk about today. So I just want to make that point as well. Um, to I, I don't profess that, you know, what we're going to cover has all the answers to everyone's uh, mental health issues so make sure we're real about it at the same time yeah there's no panacea there's no one one size fits all for absolutely everybody so i think it's a really good distinction and yeah. um I mean, i'm sure that um there's some a time frame that if someone is staying in one of the lows that you mentioned for longer than you know x number of days or a week or two that might be a good signal that they need to talk to someone who's professional in terms of understand how the mind works and mindset and help them understand what they need to do to get out of it whether that's professional therapy or whatnot yeah, absolutely. And, you know, some of these points that we'll run through sort of give avenues and opportunities to, to flag those situations as well. So maybe, do you want to dive into them? Yeah, dive let's do it. Them? Yeah, let's so right the, you know, I, I've tried, I try to keep things simple. So I've brought down to five points here. And the first one we've sort of already talked about, but is let yourself be you. Um, don't feel like there's this pressure. There's a lot of uh, media that talks about the importance of positivity and so forth, which, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of. Don't get me wrong, but at the same time, it's just being allowing yourself to go through the natural cycles of emotional states. I think that's a very healthy, healthy thing to give yourself permission to do. Uh, I know it's certainly something I've had to learn to do uh, a little better. Did you yeah, want to jump point. in? Yeah, just a quick, a quick comment on that is I've, I've run to folks where um, they feel bad for not being in a positive state. 
almost like they, um, what's the word? They, they, they weren't able to maintain a level of positivity through a challenge and they kind of feel bad about that, which doesn't help at all. Right. So it's, it's a bit of a lack of self-acceptance in that case. And just that it's okay to have a, a bit of a, a rougher time. Absolutely. And I think there's ways to do that too. I mean, you, you know, you don't necessarily have to wear your anxious or depressed mindset right out there in front of your team. Um, that might not be that helpful, but just recognize you are having a bit of a, a downtime and seek the, the space to do it appropriately, whatever that might look like. But that kind of comes in a number two, uh, yep. which I think is absolutely critical, is to find and develop great support. And what I mean by that is, is have people that you trust, that know you, that you can speak very openly and very truthfully to. Uh, one of the, or the, by far the biggest, you know, thing that manifests ill mental health is keeping it to yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a problem shared is a problem halved, so they say, but it's this notion of emotions are an actually a physical thing. They're an energy. And when we suppress them and we keep them inside, they just sit there and they grow and they get bigger and they just take on a life of their own. But when we can express them and get them out, and that can actually be to no one if you want to, or just you know writing it out on a bit of paper. But if you've got people that know how to listen and can also guide you, where you know I've got some people that when I talk to, they allow me to speak, but they also help sort of see me, help me see things a little clearer. Uh, so those kind of people are very, very powerful. And I say, I mean, I use the words very intentionally at the beginning to find and develop great support because I think it is a skill set. Uh, I don't think you can just go to your best friend and start to unload on them. If they haven't got the skills to understand how to listen or to how to be reflective to you or how to empathize, empathize versus sympathize, like there is a skill set there to be developed, uh, which mm -hmm. probably goes beyond this conversation. But, you know, I can't speak highly enough about having that network or even that one person that you can speak openly to is very, very helpful. What, what do you think, Jamie, are some of the key attributes of that person? And I suppose they'll be different. Like everyone's going to be looking for something slightly different. What are some of the, the key things that you would say um, are important to have in that, that confidant or that mentor or the person that you're, you're, you're sharing with? Yeah, it's a great question, Dan. And I'll probably speak generally and, and maybe personally and, you know, let's start with the person. For me, it's someone that can firstly just listen without judgment. So, you know, I feel I can feel like they are just purely listening to what I've got to say without thinking about how to fix it or telling me about how I should be thinking about it mm -hmm. um, to allow me just to get it out there. And then the idea for me is that someone that can then take what I've said, maybe they, they can see it a little differently and they can ask some thoughtful questions such as, you know, have you ever thought about, you know, why that might be helpful to you? Or have you ever thought about X, Y, or Z? And not to tell me about what I should be thinking, but just to help me to get a different thought process going in, in my head. Um, you know, I think that's very helpful. And also someone that can probably recognize when the conversation is moving into a space that's beyond their abilities to be able to uh, help you you know that's sort of what I mentioned before where if you've got great people that can sort of see when you're maybe teetering on the edge maybe they can point you or suggest or give you introductions to to people who could help beyond that yeah that makes a lot of sense I think one of the key things he says they can listen without judgment and not try to have an agenda or get I think the term you said was fix they ask yeah. you different questions so you can get some different clarity and you mentioned about feelings um, and thoughts can lead to feelings. And so if we have different thoughts, we can lead to different feelings as well, which I think can tie into that. So, okay, that's great. So what about number three? Uh, before we jump into number three, I do want to yeah. touch on one thing, Dan. And again, it's definitely from a personal point of view, but something I, I do see in others is that that word you said about emotion. Um, and maybe more for the guys out there, for the girls, although I don't want to generalize, but you know, sometimes we, we like to be the tough ones and to think we have to hold it all together. And I can tell you that's, that's a big mistake, <laughs> you know, being yeah. willing to be very open and let those emotions flow is look, it's gold. It's absolute gold. And you become a more robust, uh, um, what's the word I'm thinking of your, your tenacity and your ability to handle tough times only grows when you're comfortable getting those emotions out. I think it's, it's a form of resiliency. 
right? Not not yeah. self-judging, be able to express and get get those things out. And I think that comes back to that the number one thing you said about having someone who will listen without judgment. We need to feel we have a safe place to be able to express, right? Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we we may continue to hold things in, and that's not going to yeah. be uh, effective. So, yeah, great point. Yeah, cool. So number three is it's the it's the real basics, um, which is the the, the the habits and practices around breathing properly. I mean, there's a whole topic there, something I've been exploring uh, a lot lately. We probably don't have time to go into that, but breathing, I think, is is critically important. Doing doing properly, sleep, eating well, moving, exercise, and getting into nature. Uh, they're five just fundamental physical practices that you know are at the root of you know good mental health and i'm certainly not the first one to declare these five and i've got them in order actually intentionally um breathing if anyone was interested i highly recommend checking out the, the book breathe by um oh now his name escapes me nesta james nesta uh pretty sure it's james nesta a great book just going through the history of, of how we've become a bit screwed up in the way we breathe and why it's important. When we breathe better, we sleep better. When we sleep better, we're energized. We've got the, uh, the self-discipline to eat well and to go and exercise. And when we do those things, it just snowballs. And the last one of getting into nature, nature grounds us. It's like we are nature, but mm. we often see ourselves as different. And when we can be out there and seriously, man, go hug a tree. It's therapeutic. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that, that's number three. It's the physical, it's the physical practices. Okay, so these these are easy to do, but they're also easy not to do, right? And with business owners, all the pressures they've got, the schedules, the demands, the timelines, the you know being pulled in a lot of different directions. How, how do you how do you guide somebody to take time during the day to breathe? Are you suggesting that take a few minutes out, block out distractions, just practice some breathing exercises in the middle of the day, or is this a morning evening ritual? What are your what's your your guidance there? It can be any, and you know, it's probably too too shallow or early in the conversation to start being prescriptive. I mean, if people were curious about this, I would say read that book because it really opened my eyes. And I'd heard about breathing significantly before this, and um, it, it, it's got tons of how tos in there and and why. So, but all of these five, are you right, Dan? These are they're often habit changes, which habits are hard to form. You know, no matter. Mm what hack or thing you try to do it's just it's one of the things we find most challenging so you know i say set yourself up for success once again like start micro start at a level that you know you can win at uh it might not be the level that's going to make a big change but that's not the first step the first step is winning and feeling like you can do it so even if it is you once a day practice three deep breaths and you find a way to remind yourself to do that and you do that, that will lead to the next thing. It might be one night a week, get full eight hours. Like I don't care what night it is, but just one night, get eight hours uh, or get to bed before nine or whatever it is that you, you feel you need to do. Same with eating. I mean, all these things, just small chunks, small chunks. Yeah, agreed. Well, it's the compound effect of them all adding up, right? And I think it's important too, like you said, about getting a micro win because a micro win is still a win. And you know, as humans, we need to feel a sense of progress and some kind of uh, of um, advancement in what we're doing. Otherwise, we can feel stale and and stuck. And especially, you know, to times like this, when people might actually have already felt pushed back, getting a few wins on the board, I think would be huge. And these are things that don't just uh, impact your business, but your life in general, right? I mean, having effective breathing, exercise, sleep habits, things like that. So it's uh, it's interesting. We, you and I have had conversations about the difference between a sapper and a zapper. Right, that that person that lights up a room, or the person that pulls all the oxygen out of a room when they walk in, and you know these these habits that you're mentioning. I mean, they turn you into a bit of a zapper, don't they? Right, you, you, and you never know what that next deal is going to happen. It could be, you know, just how your handshake is. Well, maybe not these days. <laughs> <laughs> your energy on a Zoom call, you could make the difference between someone thinking, "Hey, I think this person would be a good fit," or "Wow, there's just something there I'm not sure." Right. So it's these little things mm-hmm. that can have a, a big uh, offshoot impact. So, hundred um, percent, yeah. A lot of it can be intangible. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. Well, what about number four? So number four um, is curate your content intentionally and wisely. And what I mean by that is uh, every day we're taking in information from all different sources, but, you know, the big ones are media and the people that we're around. 
So be very selective uh, and be intentional. It's easy to throw the radio on and listen to the news. Uh, it's easy to jump on your social media feed and just take whatever comes at you. It's easy to listen to the people um, that are around you and whatever they've got to say, good or bad. And sometimes we're not really aware of how we're making choices here. Um, but it is absolutely critical. Like it is the, it's the programming that goes into our head. And with these days, with so much content out there that we do get to 100% curate, we can be, we can be our own DJ, you know, 80% of the time. So that is yeah. something you have the power to affect immediately. And, you know, Dan, the quality of content out there, I don't need to tell you because, I mean, you produce some of the best out there, brother. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. But it's, there's just world-class stuff out there that we've never had access to before. And so why not tap into it? So that's number four. Yeah, that's a, that is such a great point. I mean, I remember when you you turned me on to Jim Rohn back in the 2007, I think it was. That was a little bit life changing for me in terms of just the shift in perspective. And that's just one uh, one CD at the time. And you're right. There's we can get any podcast we want. We can uh, there's excellent curated videos on YouTube, conferences, webinars, all that good stuff, books. Um, but I, I think what you're what you're really talking about is getting away from the momentum of the same habits we've had in terms of our content. Uh, consumption. You know, I've heard the term doom scrolling, where people hop on Twitter or whatever mm -hmm. their social feed is and just look at this negative thing. And then that leads to the next negative thing and the next negative thing. So, you know, you know, if, and you're right, it's, it, we're filling ourselves up with that. And that changes how we feel about things. It changes our thoughts, which again, leads to those feelings. So if we're putting in 50 negative uh, thoughts or negative images, you know, from uh, the world around us, we do need to replace that. Otherwise, we're going to ha start having a net default negative outlook on things it really has a, a huge impact i've heard this stat it's four to one for every every time someone tells you you can't do something you need four people to tell you you can't um and yeah. you know the doom scroll i hadn't heard that before but i think the other problem with social media is actually the opposite where you're just seeing everyone's highlight reel you're just seeing all the good <laughs> things that are out there and you start to compare yourself and go well, gee my life's crap compared to how good these <laughs> people are why don't I have 10 abs hanging out like, like that? <laughs> um, it's, you know, I don't think it's real. Um, and it's a distraction and it feeds the wrong uh, chemicals and emotions in our, our mind. So, you know, I, I'm a huge advocate not to spend a lot of time on social media or standard media. I mean, curate your own, create your own. That's the, that's the goal. Yeah, stuff that fills you up, stuff that gets you thinking, stuff that gets you feeling a little bit better. Right. Yeah. Things that energize you that, you know, that give you new ideas. And, and sometimes you got to listen to stuff you disagree with things that challenge your thoughts, right. Get yeah. you playing devil's advocate for yourself and saying, well, hang on, I don't really like this person's approach. I don't like their attitude, but let me just give them a listen see what they have to say. Maybe there's a nugget of, of gold in there that I just hadn't been, I've been closed off to, right. You just never know it's what right. you're going to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. That's, that's some great advice. And what about number five? So number five is probably more specific to uh, our current environment and specific business owners. And number five is plan for a worst case scenario. And that's a bit of a contradictory thing, I guess, because we certainly don't want the worst case scenario to, to come up. The, the reason why this is important and powerful is that our greatest levels of anxiety usually come from things that we can't identify, but they're these fears that run around in our head and these stories that we tell ourselves consciously or unconsciously. Yeah, fear so of the future. I'm doing, is I'm doing that, putting the, that worst case thing, that worst case thing on paper, map it out and say, okay, if, this, if my business went under, I lost my house, I got a divorce, whatever it was, like make that really worst case thing and say, okay, what would I do? What would I do? And you start to plan your way through. And what you'll find is that, you know what? There are lots of things I can do. Actually, there's, there's different, here I could do this, I could do that. And you start to realize, actually, even in the worst case scenario, um, it's still recoverable. It's still recoverable. So then you go to the next level and say, okay, let's, we've, we've put that one to bed. We've, like, we've labeled it, we've seen it. And we know what it looks like. We know we can come back from it if it happened, which, you know, hopefully it never does. But now let's look at some different scenarios that could happen more likely in our business. And particularly from a cash flow point of view, like just mm -hmm. run some different cash flow scenarios. So you can see, okay, worst here, second worst here, third, and, and so on. But whatever you, whatever level you need to sort of get some transparency at, 
so you haven't got these monsters in the closet that you haven't seen. Um, and when you see the monster in your closet, you realize it's not as big and scary as you, your mind is, is sort of making it out to be. And it puts you in a position of control. It was actually so, a pile of laundry. <laughs> yeah, right. it doesn't mean that it's going to make it any better necessarily, or it doesn't mean that, you know, we're going to find all the answers, but it just, it just arms you with awareness. And that just helps to quieten the monkey mind um, yep. that's sitting there with a, with a, a pitchfork in your, in your head. Yeah, I think that monkey mind, that's, that's the, the, the part of our thinking process that really leads us to cognitive distortions and some of that all or nothing thinking like if this happened, well, then this will happen for sure. When in reality, that's one option. It doesn't necessarily mean that X is going to happen. It could be Y is it or A, B or C or D. So I think mm -hmm. that's some great advice. And there's a, there's a book called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Susan Jeffers that talks about a similar concept around um, writing out what, what is it you're actually afraid of. And, you know, whatever, what's that saying, Jamie, whatever we resist uh, or yeah, persists, but if we can yes. give something life, then it, it can fly away. So, yeah. you know, if you write it down, you can say, Hey, that's not really as scary as I thought, or it is, but now I've, I can come up with a plan. I can think about it and, you know, take some action to yeah, mitigate. And the truth is the, the fear and the scariness might still be there. And, and that's, that's fine. But at least you know what it's about. You it's tangible. It's, it's not it's, generalized as a, a general generalized. fear. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Like I'm nervous yeah. about running out of cash as opposed to I'm worried about losing my business. It's well, okay, well, cash is one thing. What can we do about that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, it's not necessarily, most people like to avoid these types of exercises, um, but the, it's, it's counterintuitively helpful, I guess would be the way to say. Well, sometimes thinking is the hardest thing to do because we have to confront stuff, right? We have mm -hmm. to actually deal with our fears and worries as opposed to just procrastinate on them and just stay busy. Right. Mm -hmm. but if, we're, if we're staying busy, which is very easy to do, then we don't deal with these things and the anxiety or fear, the worry, or just even a, a, a diminished positivity will have a tendency to persist. So I think it's that's some great advice. So if we recap, number one was let yourself be you. Number two, find and develop great support. So people who will listen to you without judgment. Uh, number three was some uh, habits to develop. So breathing uh, properly, getting enough sleep, eating well, exercise, getting out into nature, really getting grounded. Uh, number four is curate your content um, intentionally. So being careful what you allow in as well. And then number five, plan for the worst case scenario. So you can see that maybe it's not quite as bad as you've been, you've been worrying about. So I think those are some, uh, those are some fantastic uh, tips, Jamie. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Can I, I just want to share one more thing. Yeah. In, and this is more of a, a philosophy point that in times of stress and times of difficulty is and again, I'm not the first person to say this, but there's, it's our greatest gifts here because it's easy to be confident, easy to be positive when things are good. But when things are not good, it highlights the areas where we, we've got, we, we can grow yeah. and areas where we can become better. And if we embrace that uncomfortability, we can find gold. Um, the danger is if we stick our head in the sand, um, then that we get no benefit from it. And it, none of it's comfortable. None of it's comfortable. So it's, it's being okay with that with that, that little flutter that sits inside all those feelings that we don't <laughs> like to have, like embrace them, say thank you, you know, thank you for this. Yeah, it's interesting perspective about being, uh, being getting a little bit comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Just mm -hmm. sort of living with that sort of, like you said, the flutter. Uh, fantastic. Look, Jamie, this has, been, this has been great. I've learned a lot. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share your wisdom and insights. And um, yeah, wishing you continued success. And thanks a lot, my friend. I really appreciate it. Dan, I, you know, always great chatting to you and um, really anytime. All right, man. Look, have yourself a fantastic day and we'll catch you soon. Thanks, Dan. See ya.